Today, uh, we continue our series on the book of Revelation. The missing dimension in Thyatira, part nine. So this is the missing dimension in the church of Thyatira, part nine. We have two or three readings, starting with the first one, Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 to 29. That's Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 to 29. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira writes, This thing says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servant to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent for her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Verse 23, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Verse 24, now to you I say, and to the rest in the entire, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the death of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come, and he who overcomes and keeps my work still until the end, to him I will give power over nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Mm. Again, the letter is addressed to a specific church in Tertara. But the warning is given to all churches. That means the application of what is being taught here is for all the churches. Well, I must just say that this is the first time in my life I teach uh, on this particular passage in a, in a church setting. I've taught in a house group, but not in a church setting. The church in Thyatira was not a sleeping church. What well, this church has been referred to as the corrupt church. I must admit that I was uh, a little bit Uh, not confused, not uncomfortable, but uh, I had a bit of reservation. Because if this church is referred to as the corrupt church, then how shall we call all the churches in the world then? Okay, let me recap a little bit something here. This church historically is referred to as a corrupt church. But let's see this church. Hmm. Verse 
verse 19. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. What more can you ask of a church? This wasn't a sleeping church like Sardis. Now, you know, if you are in church like this, everything goes, everything works. You know, it's a loving church. It's a very welcoming church. It's a dynamic church, as they say. You know, the last work are better in quality, greater in volume than the first. It's a loving church. They're very patient with the weak. What more can you ask of a church? It wasn't a sleeping church like Sardis. It wasn't a lukewarm church like uh, uh, Laodicea. It wasn't a loveless church like uh, Ephesus. It was a dynamic church, as I often hear. This church did not forsake its first love. Their good work were ever increasing. They persevered in good work with zeal, and they were commended for that. There was an overflow of good works, and the Lord commended them for their vitality and the high level commitment to the work. They certainly went the extra mile. What more? Can you ask? What more? Everything a church could desire was there. Every one of us want to be loved. Every one of us want to be cared for. Every one of us wants attention and care, spiritual care, etc. It was there in that church. And remember, this is the Lord speaking. So this is by God's standard. The introduction of the letter to this church indicates that nothing was hidden from the Lord's sight. Why? Because he has eyes like a flame of fire. Peace in eyes. Peace in eyes. Nothing is hidden from the Lord. He said, I know your work. To every, almost all the churches say, I know your work, I know you. And I will give to each one of you according to your work. The Lord knows you, he knows me. He knows each one of us. He knows where we stand in this church. He knows what we do in this church. Nothing is hidden from him. He will give to each one according to his work from what he sees in our heart, in our secret, and what we do for, to, against his church. Nothing is hidden from God. The purity of the Lord's eye is able to pierce deeply and to discern the reality of one's heart and the real state of the church as a whole. In the Atara, the Lord revealed the root cause of the prevailing evil. Beyond all this good stuff, the Lord revealed to this church the root cause of the reason why he was displeased. That woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess was the problem in that church. In verse 
4 Now to you I say and to the rest in Thyatira as many as do not have this doctrine it's all about doctrine everywhere all about doctrine everywhere remember in Pergamos doctrine of Balaam doctrine of the Nicolaite now we have a diabolical Jezebelian doctrine no escape about the doctrine doctrine as we said last time only means teaching but we need to know which teaching doesn't the Bible says in uh, Act 2.42 the, they persevered in the apostles doctrine and then the Bible speaks of the doctrine of Christ and then the Bible wants and raised, the Bible, God raises ministry so that the believers will not be like children carried away by every wind of doctrine. Those to and fro, by every wind of doctrine. It's all about doctrines. One well, cannot say, what is doctrine? It's not about No, it's all about doctrine everywhere. Because the believers need to be strengthened, established, rooted, grounded, built up in the doctrine of Christ. Amen. That's the only hope. Mm. If no doctrine, no doctrine, so what? What do we do then? Do we pack up? What do we bring then to the church? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. Doctrine everywhere. Why? Because there are so many false doctrines. Because so many false prophets with different disguising, etc., have come so many to deceive the believers. With an appearing of sheep, but being worn in sheepskin. Paul told the disciple in Ephesus, I think chapter act 20. Take heed because I know that after my departure, savage wolves, savage wolves will come in and will not spare the flock. And then within yourself, false teacher will rise to deceive. You see, we have those who are coming from outside. We have those who are maturing from the, out, from the inside. I call those ones the airports. One way. Those are the ones who are welcoming the ones who are coming from outside to do the same work. So we have false prophets known as such from outside and from inside you have people who are maturing from inside to become false teachers. Those have nothing to do with the word of God. How did that happen? Because they claim in the sheepfold the other way. They did not come through the door of the sheep, Jesus Christ. They claimed the other way. And then what did they do? They made themselves a costume, like a skin, sheep skin. But inside, they are savage wolves. That is no salvation, not safe, coming with a hidden agenda. So we have those inside. Then you have high links. Do you know what the high link is? It's someone who is only interested in monetary rewards. All they do is for money. It doesn't matter whether the church falls, whether the believers are wounded, it doesn't matter. Provide a pocket money. And we have so many of them these days. We call them money preachers. So we need to be very, very careful to make sure that in the house of the Lord we have indeed received Christ. We are not deceived. Paul said, look in yourself, make sure. Be careful of where you're standing. Recognize that Christ is in you. Make sure. Make your calling obvious, certain, evident. Not sitting on the fence? No. What does the Bible say? 
in Acts 2, those who gladly receive the word. That's the first characteristic. Like a newborn baby, desire pure milk. Genuine believers love the word of God because they can't live without. They're not interested in anything else. What was the root cause of the prevailing evil? That woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. Verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servant to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now verse 24 says, as many as do not have this doctrine. So it wasn't just a practice. No, it's a doctrine. It's a teaching in the church. When I look verse 20, it doesn't seem to me that uh, the woman Jezebel's doctrine was the only problem. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. Because the Bible says, the Lord says, I have a few things, plural, plural, a few things, because. So the doctrine, the Jezebelian doctrine, was the explanation was the underlying infrastructure upon which all the lawlessness was built in that church. I have a few things against you because. So as a result of Jezebel's doctrine, everything else flowed from that. Chiefly, sexual immorality. Remember in the church of Corinth at some point Paul marveled, he said, even pagans don't have this level of immorality to the point that someone has even taken his father's wife and you have not shown any remorse at all, no grief. Remember, tolerance versus toleration. This was toleration. Because you've allowed this woman who called herself prophetess, to do this, to do what? To teach, to seduce. In this letter, the name Jezebel, sorry, you might be slightly uncomfortable with my pronunciations because I'm influenced by French. In French, we say Jezebel. So I'm a bit influenced by that pronunciation. But I will try to say Jezebel. If that sounds strange to you. So, in this letter, the name Jezebel is very significant and we need to refer, refer to the Old Testament in order to discern the role and practice of a woman called Jezebel in Israel. There has been a lot of controversy about uh, this Jezebel in, 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 in the Atara. Um, but in any case, in any case, she had the same spirit that was in Ahab's wife. No doubt about it. The same approach, the same outcome. Verse 24. Some people held on to Jezebel's doctrine, but some others did not. Some others resisted, discerned, and resisted. Her doctrine is quite similar to the doctrine of Balaam. One wonder the Holy Spirit just put them side by side, Pegamos and then uh, Thyatira. Similar doctrine. Sexual immorality, idolatry, witchcraft, occultism, sorcery. Same as Balaam's strategy. Same. 
Okay. Let's have a quick look to Jezebel in the Old Testament. I'm summarizing that for you. But it starts in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31. That way it all starts. 1 Kings 16, 31. Okay. Ahab, king of Israel, displeased the Lord by taking Jezebel as his wife. She was the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Zidonian. Jezebel led King Ahab to serve and worship Baal. 1 King 16, 31. She also drew Israel into idolatry and 400 false prophets of Asherah ate at her table. Hmm. Remember the contest, Mount Carmel with Elijah? 850 false prophets. 450 served Baal and 400 served Asherah, Astarte. This 400 here that went into contest with Elijah, they all ate at Jezebel's table. So she had a great interest in those who call themselves prophets. We just make a very quick digression here. I found that the word Asherah, Asherah, is the same word for groves. Some of you have groves. Prophet of groves. I think in particular in uh, King James, the authorized version. Prophet of groves. Prophet of Asherah. Hmm. I became very interested in that. So what, what, what's the, the junction between the two? What's the link between the two? Oh, Numbers chapter 25. When we looked at Balaam, and he repeatedly failed, in his attempt to curse and to lead Israel astray until the Israelites remain, rather than moving, they remain at a place called Acacia Grove. Oh, Acacia Grove. Oh, that might have, that must have a very particular significance. Oh, that's Numbers chapter 25, verse 1. That's the very place where they were seduced. That's the very place where Bala fulfilled his hidden agenda and was able to trap the people of God. They went into immorality uh, and idolatry and that was at Acacia Grove. Hmm, interesting. As if it was a headquarter for false prophets, for idolatry and immorality. Guess what? There seems to be a link, a correlation between sexual immorality and idolatry. All over the place in the Bible. What does the Bible say? Every other sin a man commit, a person commit, is outside his body. But sexual sin is inside. We meant to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Sexual immorality is an airport for demons. If you enter in sexual relationship with a demon possessed, possessed person, you're in real danger. Is inside. They understand that. Why do you think the Bible say, you know, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife and together become one flesh? As children of God, let be discerning. And Jezebel had achieved that. 
to have servant of God committing not only fornication now, but also adultery. Pornia in Greek. Adultery, not just adultery, also incest. The word that is used there include incest. That people from the same families committing sexual immorality. So it was a complete pandemonium. Chaos. Job says, in the shield there is no order. What does the Bible say? God is a God of order. Order must reign in his house before it's too late. Jezebel was uh, very authoritarian. She was opinionated. She was self-willed. She would do whatever she wanted to find her way and achieve any desire of her heart. In 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 8, hmm, she wrote a letter in the king's name. She used the king's seal to write to the nobles in the city of Jezreel. Why? Because she wanted to usurp. She wanted to take because of her covetousness. Because she so desperately desired neighbors land. So she took, she wrote a letter in the king's name and she used the king's seal, she put and she sent to the, all the nobles to give them a strategy as to how they would kill neighbor the just, the innocent person, in order to dispossess him from his land. Covetous, authoritarian, self-willed, opinionated, covetous, manipulative. Remember the difference between tolerance and toleration. I keep on reminding this because when we hear, let's be tolerant, oh, let, we are too harsh, let's be tolerant. Yeah, we will be tolerant to some extent only. In as much as he does not displease God, in as much as it falls within the allowed uh, boundary. If it grieves God, then tolerance must be put to flight. As simple as that. Amen. Tolerance must be exercised in the hope, remember, that there will be change in behavior, there will be improved behavior, there will be better relationship with God, there will be increased understanding of God's things. That's the purpose. That's the limit. Those are the boundaries for tolerance. No more than that. Mm -hmm. But remember, Jezebel, the woman, was given time and opportunity to repent. Did she repent? She refused. Would you apply tolerance if someone refused to repent or to do things God's way? No. We become guilty before God if we do that. Well, one we say, oh no, that's very harsh, you know. God himself is doing his work. We don't, we don't have to force people. God was not happy with people in this church because they had allowed. Mm, yeah. There is some responsibility. God does the work. Yes, how does he do it? Through the living stones through you and I because the Holy Spirit indwells in you God exalts and teaches admonish others through you now if we forsake our responsibility and we say God himself will do it how do you think God is going to do it? don't we speak to people about God in order for them to be saved? why don't we just stand there and wait for God to save them? God exalts through his people. And the word of God is the sword of the Holy Spirit. 
of the spirit. And we need to know to handle the soul. Remember the difference between tolerance and toleration. Like in the church of the Atara, King Ahab tolerated and let Jezebel achieve whatever her desire was. Just like the servant in the Atara. So was Ahab's attitude. You know, to let Jezebel become the queen of Israel. A queen in Israel, a daughter of Ethbel. Her father not only was a king, a Zidonian king, but he was himself a high priest, pagan high priest. So Ahab did not see any beautiful wife, woman in Israel to marry. His eyes was always outside. You see, I'm talking to, we don't have many young people here. I wish they were, we had many young people in order for me to say a word about engagement and marriage. Some young people never look in the church. The eyes is always outside with doubtful girl. Outside, of, what about those who worship God? What about the believers who will help you to move and to grow in Christ together? In Malachi said, God united husband and wife in order to give them a godly offspring. A godly offspring. Not divide the children. They look, dad is going there, you know, Buddhist, they look at mom, she's going there, meditation, and they are lost. Now, God united godly people in order to give them a godly offspring. In the hope that when they grow, they will choose God. A generation for God. A descendant of God. Our children have a unique grace, opportunity and favor and privilege to have Christian parents. Who worship the living God. The mighty prophet Elijah, who had just defeated 850 false prophets of Baal and Asherah, was now terrified by Jezebel and had to go in hiding. The nobles in the city of Jezreel were also terrified when Jezebel killed Naboth. They knew that Naboth was innocent, but they still executed Jezebel's wish to stone Naboth. No one was able to challenge Jesus. Mm. Interesting. Dear friends, you don't mess up with the spirit of Jesus. You don't mess up with the spirit of Jesus. No, you don't mess up. Jesus can turn everybody against you, even if you are innocent. The tactic is so refined. The lie and the level of manipulation of Jezebel is so perfect. Jezebel can turn an innocent person into a killed person deserving death. By manipulating everybody, Jezebel can turn people's hearts against an innocent person. But God sees the hearts of people. What innocent man was killed, stole. For doing nothing, just because Jezebel was desperate to dispossess his land. And she did whatever she could, including manipulation and lies, to achieve what she wanted. Jezebel is only interested in power and position. Jezebel is really uncomfortable so long as she's not able to control and manipulate. Jezebel will do whatever it takes to have an eye and control the leadership, whatever that means. Jezebel in the New Testament. She 
she called herself prophetess? Hmm. But she taught God's servant to commit sexual immorality and practice idolatry. That's strange. That's a contradiction. A prophet who teaches God's servant to commit immorality and idolatry. And she called herself prophetess. Where were the servant of God? To be taught by a woman self-proclaimed prophetess all the servant of God what kind of permissiveness is that what kind of weakness is that how did that end up happening how well I can reveal to you this morning that one of the missing dimensions in our church the first one is the role of men in the church. Men are head of families. They are spiritual head of families. So should they be in the church. Men should stand up, lead in the work of the Lord, help the spouses and their children, and stand up and move forward with the Lord in his church. I'm revealing to you this morning the first missing dimension in this church as far as God is concerned, is the role of men who are given up their own responsibility as spiritual leaders. And when you make an inference of that, you get to this situation. The woman has claimed, 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 paralyzed everybody, and she's now teaching them the wrong things including the bishops, the pastors, the elders, in that she's there and teaching, committing herself immorality, adultery with them, they commit incest, they do all this, and ultimately they bow down to idolatry, etc., because they've let that happen. Why do you think Paul is saying, I do not permit women to teach? Why? And what does that mean? Look around. This is not a sermon about whether a wife can be a pastor or not. Even though that's what I believe from, the, from, from what I see in the Bible. Because a family, uh, the church is a family and the head of the family is a man. I do not permit women to teach. says Paul. People have wiped that away. It's so politically incorrect. That's outdated. That's in Corinth, not in London. Jezebel character contrasts with that of Lydia. Lydia. In the book of Acts, I think it's Acts 16, maybe, Lydia was a businesswoman in the city of Thyatira. But they used to gather by the river and pray with other ladies. When Paul visited the riverside and they found them praying, and Paul and his company approached them and they spoke to them and they preached to them, they received the Lord. Do you know what Lydia did? Lydia said to Paul, if you found me worthy, please stay with us for some time. A new church had just started in that hour. This church we're talking about started with a group of godly ladies, chiefly a lady called Lydia. And she said, listen to humility, if you find me worthy, if I found favor in your sight, she's talking to men, men of God, please stay with us. Because if in a synagogue or a group of believers did have from 10 people beyond, 
They needed an overseer. They could not continue between them as ladies. Let no. The church has, has started. They need now an overseer. And she goes humbly to Paul and she said, can you stay with us? That means, can you teach us? Can you set the ground? Can you do something? Can you, are there men? Are there people who will continue to do this work? Can you do something before you go? We can't continue the way we used to gather together to pray. Now a minister, the church has started. Do something about this. That contrast with Jezebel, was she part of that initial work? I don't know. Was she part of that group of women and she wanted to take over the ministry? I don't know. But there is a contrast with Lydia's attitude here. A church that with a group of women. Then Jezebel came and she imposed her own way of doing things. Her sorcery and witchcraft and occultism over everybody. Such wasn't initially Lydia's attitude. Jezebel engaged the church into paganism to sacrifice and eat things that had been subjected to idols while they also offered a service to the Lord. Mm. In that sense, Christians partook to the table of demons, at the same time they partook to the table of the Lord. Abomination. Please turn with me to the next reading. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 14. Second Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Almighty. God. Listen to the next verse. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's the church of the living God. The fear of God. Are things making sense to you? I will dwell among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. God wants to dwell among us. God wants to dwell to walk before us and with us. Jezebel hates righteousness. Jezebel hates holiness. Jezebel hates sanctification. The spirit of Jezebel is a very powerful, controlling spirit. Now, I have a subtitle here. Discerning the lie about Jezebel. 
discerning the lie about the spirit of Jezebel. One single passage in the Bible has led people to interpret or understand the spirit of Jezebel insufficiently. I stop short of saying wrongly. But I prefer to say insufficiently. Because the general understanding of the spirit of Jesus is not totally wrong, but it is insufficient. The missing parts, that's what I call lie. Generally, it is believed that the spirit of Jezebel only works in female. Lie. In 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 30, we read, 2 Kings 9, 30, Now, when Jehu had come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she put paints on her eyes and adorned her head and looked through a window. Now, because of this sentence here, just this sentence here, people have concluded that the spirit of Jezebel is a female spirit that only works in female. Wrong. Just because Jezebel made her the makeup, she painted herself, she adorned herself, does not mean the spirit of Jezebel is a female spirit that only works in females. That's a lie. Hopefully we're learning a little something. By the way, the contrast to the way Jezebel behaved in contrast to that, godly women are commanded to have a chaste conduct, a godly conduct, accompanied by fear. In fact, the name Jezebel in Hebrew, Isabel, also means unchaste. Unchaste. Immoral. But godly women are commanded to be chased by God. Next reading, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we read from verse 3 to verse 5, in contrast to Jezebel. 1 Peter 3, 3 to 5. Speaking about wives, women, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, and putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trust in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husband, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. That is the godly model. Complete contrast with Jezebel. Desire to lord over men and over the servant of God, to teach them, to influence them, etc. This is godly women here. The inner beauty, a quiet spirit, submission. The hidden person of heart with incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of the Lord. This contrast with the haughty, 
vengeful, covetous, manipulative, intimidating, and controlling spirit of Jezebel. The spirit of Jezebel is so manipulative that he can turn everyone against an innocent person, but only for achieving her own controlling position and goals. A person controlled by this spirit is inclined to use witchcraft and occultism to achieve their purpose and goals. Remember, in Thyatira, there were people who held on to this doctrine. You see, the spirit of Jezebel is more than just uh, an exaggerated makeup or doubtful fashion and lust. Yes, the most visible manifestation of this spirit is seduction, seduction, apoplanao, seduction, apoplanao in Greek. Apo, attracting, leading astray, planao, through charms and spells and magic. That is seduction. Young ladies, if a man comes to you and say, I want to marry you because you've seduced me, say, I'm not a witch. I'm not a seductress, no. Seduction is one of the words in the Bible that has only a negative meaning, like sin. Seduction is one of them. There's no positive. In the world, people want to be called seductress because, yeah, that's exactly what they do. They are trapped, you know, through charms, through magic, through spells, etc. But seduction comes from the Greek word, apoplanao, attracting, leading astray through the use of magic and spells and charms. Sexual immorality, which includes adultery, lack of moral restraint, and limited avidity for idolatry. However, there is more to it. Jezebel taught and seduced God's servant to eat things sacrificed to idols. Yet the Lord says, final reading, in conclusion. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 20 to 22. Verse 20 to 22. Rather, the things which the Gentiles sacrificed, they sacrificed to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? What Jezebel introduced? Eating things sacrificed to idols? As well as celebrating the Lord's table in the house of the Lord? People are not allowed to go, you know, and have fellowship with demons and come and take a party to the Lord's table and do the it doesn't work like that. Because there can be a sudden judgment. By this point. I'm sure that we begin to see and discern that the spirit of Jezebel is not necessarily a spirit that works only in female. It is a controlling spirit that also works in men. Controlling men. Overly controlling men. Hungry for power. In Hebrew, the word Jezebel is Isabel. The second part of the word, Zebel, comes from the word Zebul, Z-E-B-U-L. It was a Philistine god of Canaan. The word Zebul, which is the, the final part of Jezebel, also means dominion, habitation, elevation, height, lofty above. When combined Baal and Zebul, you have what? Baal, Zebul, Baal, Zebul which is a priest demon. We're going to stop there. But uh, those who held to the Jezebelian doctrine were likely to have known the death of Satan. A normal Christian cannot sustain such doctrine. The Lord encourages those who resist and fight against the spirits and the doctrine of Jezebel. Hold fast to what you have. Till I come. God willing, we should continue 
the second part of the church in Thyatira. May the Lord bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you and we say thank you for the way, Lord, you've led us this morning. We commit our souls, our spirit, our hearts, our lives unto you and submit to the headship of uh, Christ Jesus that, Lord, our mind will not be enticed to any form of idolatry or sexual immorality or seduction or deception or doctrinal error. We pray that, Lord, you help us to cling on and to abide in the Apostles' Doctrine, the Doctrine of Christ. Lord, help us to be steadfast and immovable in you by the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We commit each one of us unto your hands. Open our eyes, Lord, that the scales will fall, that, Lord, we will see Jesus Christ and him alone. As, Lord, we exalt you in this place, in this church, in our hearts. Have thine own way. Be exalted above all, for you are the Lord of lords, the kings of kings, bright and morning star. May Christ be fully formed in our hearts until Lord, the Son of Righteousness rises. Lord, we bless you. We commit this church unto your holy hand. Protect this flock, we pray, because you are Jehovah Nissi. We give you praise and glory. Bless our time of fellowship together. Bless each one of us. Strengthen, Lord, each one of us. We pray that you raise up those who are unwell in their bodies, those who are weary and struggling in various ways. We pray that, Lord, you will be the answer. We give you praise and glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.